All right, so today we are going to tackle a difficult subject. So just one more reminder, this is going to be a great message for your kids to go to middle school or elementary. Okay, this is, this is, uh, this is the last time that, uh, that we'll kind of give that, uh, that statement out there. But what we're talking about today is a subject that for a lot of us can still be taboo. And we're not just talking about house flipping, okay? We're not talking about Chip and Joe, okay? We're talking about something that is a huge, huge transformation, but yet we don't even realize it. We're asking the question, what would the world be like if Jesus stayed in the grave, if Jesus was never born? What would the world look like? And so today's subject is, what would the world look like without Jesus when it comes to sex, women, and marriage? I'd be like, wow, this was the perfect day to come to church. Others of you are going, wow, I picked of all days today to come to church. No, we live... We live in a world that has been changed through Christ. And so it's really hard for us to appreciate a lot of what Christ did and how countercultural that Jesus was. Because it's almost like we're going into a house that has been flipped, but we've never seen the before picture. We're only experiencing. What, it, what it's nice and, and how, how beautiful it is. And, you know, we're going on and on about, wow, I would like to buy everything in this house, Joanna, but it would be $10,000, all right? But what helps us is when we see the before picture, we can truly appreciate what the after picture is like. There's a, there, there's a big myth out there that the Christian patriarchy keeps women in this inferior, lowly place. But it's actually not the case at all. That women, what we're going to discover, women are in such an elevated place because of what Christ did. That this whole idea of, of, of Christianity is suppressing of women is... You know, if, if, if you like this term, it's, it's fake news, all right? Or if you prefer the previous president, you know, it's, uh, it's mi misinformation, all right? So here's the thing. We have to see the before. We have to see the ugly if we're truly going to appreciate the after. Now, in the, the, the Greco-Roman world, okay, that's a fancy way of saying the, the culture that Jesus found himself born into as a, as a human, where, where he entered himself into history, this Greek and then Roman culture that he found himself, which was really a reflection of all the cultures of that time, women had such little value that if you were a woman that made it to her teenage years, that was pretty impressive because more likely than not, you were going to be abandoned as a baby. There was a, there was a, a common saying that when a woman was giving birth, they would say, if it's a boy, you celebrate, but if it's a girl, you cast it out. They would literally throw a live baby away if it was a girl. They had such little value. Plato, he believed and taught that cowardly men were reincarnated as women. That that was the punishment of being a cowardly man. In the Greek world, women had the same social and legal status as male slaves. And in the Roman world, it got a little bit better. Legally and socially, they were somewhere between a slave and a man. But they still had this terrible, terrible place in culture. A historian of the time said that a baby girl was an economic liability and a social burden. 
women could not leave the house, no matter how grown you were, women could not leave the house without a male escort. Women could not speak in public. They couldn't show their face in public. They had to be veiled. If the husband had guests in his home, if, uh, if your husband is inviting the guys over, she could not be in their presence. Women, you needed to go somewhere else. You could, it wasn't even that the women got to serve. No, go. You cannot be in the presence of men. Legally, women were the property of their husbands. If a woman had an affair outside of her marriage, that was considered adultery and punishable by death. If a man had an affair outside of his marriage, that was considered a property violation against another man's property. It was not considered any type of adultery. A husband could kill his wife at any time, totally legally. Women had no property rights and were not represented in government. Sex was everywhere. It was super common. Pornography was everywhere. And I don't mean like it's everywhere like it is today. No, like your fine china would have pornography on it. The mug that you drank coffee, it would be like that. It was everywhere. You'd hang flags out in your yard to celebrate your type of sex. It was a terrible, immoral culture that was surrounding everything. Marriage was such a joke that weddings, they were nothing like what they are today. Now we celebrate and we, we spend lots of money and everybody gets dressed up. Then it was, well, let's just sign some legal papers. It's kind of like buying a new car. That was all it was. It was a, to quote another historian, marriage was a disagreeable necessity. And because of this Greco-Roman influence, the Israelite people were even influenced to begin to treat women in a bad way. That, that God had established the proper way to treat women. That, that you see Eve, she talked with God in the garden. And then you see people like, just to name two, a, a lady like Deborah, who was a leader in Israel, okay? She was the judge over Israel for a time. And then you see this influence even drag down the people of God to where now there's traditions when Jesus was being born to where people, to where women could not speak in public. They could not testify in court and they couldn't even be educated. That it was considered immoral for a woman to be taught anything. So when we look at the world that Jesus stepped into, Women had no value. They were shunned. They were silent. They were the background. They were objects. And they were property. That was the world that Christ was born into. And so with this as the background, with this as the before picture, I want us to look at some things that, that if, if you've been a Christian for a while, you, you've seen these things, but you've never experienced them knowing this. Because what you're about to see is Jesus blew people's minds and changed the world forever. Let's talk about the Samaritan woman first. This was a, a time when Jesus was traveling from one city to, to the next. And we're kind of going to do some rapid fire things. Jesus is traveling from one city to the next. His disciples go into town to take care of some food and supplies. Jesus hangs out at the well. This lady comes up and Jesus talks to her. Now, you might be like, so? Jesus talked to her. No, 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 no. In our culture, totally cool. In Jesus' culture, what in the world is going on? Matter of fact, this is exactly 
her reaction to Jesus striking up a conversation with this lady. Here's what it says in verse 9, John chapter 4, verse 9. It says, you're a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She is completely shocked. Not only are they culturally different, Jew and Samaritan, I'm a woman. You should not be talking to me. And they end up having this long conversation. And when Jesus' disciples come back, this is their reaction. It says this. It says, just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? Jesus was shattering cultural norms. Jesus was doing stuff that was crazy, okay? Like, I'm sure as the disciples were walking back, they were texting with each other, okay? And the emojis that were going back and forth were the emoji with like the mushroom cloud coming out of the head, okay? Blowing minds here. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Jesus is actually talking to a lady. Jesus, do you not know what you're doing? But Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And another time, um, Jesus goes to visit some friends. Um, he had three friends. They were actually all siblings. It was a guy named Lazarus and then his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Well, Lazarus actually passes away. He dies. And Mary and Martha uh, are called Jesus to come and and. and, and see him, they want him to heal Lazarus before Lazarus dies, but he ends up dying while Jesus is on his way there. So Mary and Martha, they're super let down. They're crushed. Their brothers just died. They don't know why Jesus didn't jog. I mean, come on, Jesus, get here fast. All right. But Jesus shows up and not only is it just crazy that Jesus is even talking with these women, he goes even further. Here's what he does. He actually teaches Martha. He actually discusses spiritual things with Martha. That wasn't supposed to be done. You don't do that, Jesus. It's a woman. That's supposed to be a thing that, Jesus, you only do with men. But Jesus, he invites her over and has this private conversation with her. And here's what Jesus says. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? He is doing something that to us, not a big deal, but to them, huge, absolutely huge, that Jesus is showing her her value. I feel your pain. I know that your brothers just died. I'm not going to shun you. I'm not going to put you to the side. Now that your brother's gone, I'm not going to be like, well, brother's gone. See ya. No, no, no. I care about you. And I want to teach you. I want you to come in and learn from me. Now, to wrap up that story, Jesus actually raises Lazarus from the dead and it's super cool. But here's my favorite one. Here's my favorite example of God just completely shattering the cultural norm. I want you to, to imagine God is gonna do something that has never been done before. Something that is just totally crazy. What he is gonna do is he himself is going to come to earth. He's gonna, he's gonna come down, he's gonna enter earth as a human, and he is going to live among the people that he created. Now, if you were going to do that, and you were a God that only liked men, what you would do is you would tell the most important man you could find, right? Or if you're just making all this stuff up, 
If you're making up the Bible, you would write it something really cool. Yeah, I was out hunting lions one day, and then God came down and was like, bro, I'm about to do something awesome. Be ready. All right? You would think that would be how it goes. But here's what you and I know. God broke the news to a woman first. And not even to an important one. He broke the news to a young girl that lived in the middle of nowhere. Here's how God announced it. It says, Gabriel appeared to her. This is Mary, Jesus, Jesus, the lady who's going to be Jesus' mom. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. God is, is with a woman? That, 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 can, that can happen? God, God even likes that type of people? Okay, yes. He says, you are favored and the Lord is with you. And I love the next line. This is one of those things that when you read your Bible, sometimes you just like read right over it, but I love it. This is, this is what the Bible says. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Okay, can you imagine this? All of a sudden, you're a girl, you're in the background, you can't even speak in public. And all of a sudden, God sends an angel to you and gives you the best news, the secret that what he is about to do, would you not be confused and disturbed? All right, of course you would be. This is what God did. That Jesus is shattering what is going on in the culture. But it wasn't just Christ. Jesus' followers eventually embraced this as well. Matter of fact, the first person to ever believe in Jesus Christ from the continent of Europe was a lady. We actually find this in Acts chapter 16. Here's how it goes down. Paul, he's, he's on this trip and he is going to, he is going to, to Europe. He's, he's planting churches as he goes. And it says this in verse 13 of Acts chapter 16. It says, on the Sabbath, we, and this is you know, Paul and, and the guy that wrote the book of Acts, his name is Luke. It says, on the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to the riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some, what? Women who had gathered there. Verse 14, one of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant. Whoa, she's already crazy, okay? You should, you should be at the house, lady. Not, not, not business, okay? Not CEO Lydia, okay, selling your, your fancy purple clothes, all right? No, no, no. It says, one of those Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God, as she listened to us, men speaking and teaching and sharing God with women, she accepted what Paul was saying. These guys went totally against their culture. They could have said, hmm, looks like just a bunch of women down there. Let's go find some men. No, they go down and history is changed. The first person to believe in Christ from the continent of Europe was a lady named Lydia. One more I want to share with you. Paul, as he's as he's writing all of these letters to all of these churches that, that he has begun and in churches he just wants to encourage, always at the end of his letters, he likes to thank people, okay? It's almost like he, he loves to give shout outs, okay? And here's what he says in the biggest letter that he writes, here's who he thanks, Romans chapter 16. He says, first one, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a lady who is a deacon in the church. She's on the org chart, okay? She is a big deal, and he calls her out in the Bible. This is crazy. I don't, I don't think you're fully getting this. This is nuts. And he continues, and he says this. He says, welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor. Women, for the first 
for the first time in a long time, he's saying, look, these women are worthy of honor. This is not only who Christ is. This is who we as Christians are going to be. There's not going to be men and then women off somewhere. We are going to be people who love each other. And this lady, she is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many, especially to me. And then he goes on the very next verse, and, and throughout the whole thing, he keeps talking. But even here, he says, very next thing, he mentions two ladies right off the bat. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, okay? He mentions the lady first and then the husband, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ. He's not saying, yeah, me and Aquila, you know, we, we do all the heavy lifting. Priscilla just makes the sandwiches, okay? That's not Paul. He says, look, I'm Paul, and then there's Aquila, and then there's Priscilla. We're all co-workers. That we are all in this together. We are on equal footing. Jesus did not come to start a women's liberation movement. But what he did was make things right again. Jesus' mission was on an eternal scale. But what Jesus was correcting was what this culture had corrupted about women, that he is bringing them back into the place that God had ordained them to be. Paul puts it very succinctly in Galatians chapter 3. He says, you all are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 28, he lays it out. He says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is, look, yes, there are differences between us, but we are all on the same playing field when it comes to, to God. That there's not like men are here and women are somewhere down here. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Don't miss next week because Andy's going to unpack this verse even more. I think my favorite week is actually going to be next week. So I want to make sure that you're back. But the Christian movement, the Jesus followers, everything that they're doing, they're not doing something brand new. They're going back to how it was in the very beginning where God set everything up. Because God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. That God made men in his own image, but he also made women in his own image. That men do not have a different spot and women are subservient. Sure, in the family, men and women have different roles, but one's not better than the other. They are created both in the image of God. In the garden, Adam didn't talk to God and leave Eve off to the side. It says, it says they, Adam and Eve, walked with God and talked with God together. This is how God intended things to be. It was corrupted and Jesus and his followers were bringing things back right. Now we could stop right here and this would be a really great lecture, okay? You, you would learn some stuff. You might even appreciate some things. But here's the, here's the deal. We as a church, we believe in life change. That it's not just enough to know, we have to do. It's not just enough to hear, it needs to change who we are. So what do we do with this? I want to look at one verse and answer the question, what do we do with what we've learned? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says this, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit 
adultery. That this command was, was written to Christians saying, look, you've seen this big tidal wave of change. You live in a, in a culture that is perverse. They don't value marriage. Sex is rampant. But you're different. You give honor to marriage. And you remain faithful to one another. That is God's call. We need to know that marriage is a big deal. That before God instituted the church, before God instituted government, God made the family. And that's why men and women and sex and marriage, it's all connected. Because if we're going to get one right, we have to get them all right. We need to know that sex is a big deal. That sex is not casual. We live in a highly sexualized culture, but so do they. I think a lot of times what, what we do is we sometimes rationalize. We go, well, in our world, it's like this. Therefore, we don't have to, we don't have to obey what God says. If anything, we live in a more pure world than they did. Yet this was God's command to them. And he says, look, you need to avoid two things. You need to avoid sexual immorality. He's saying, look, you need to avoid sex before marriage. And then you need to avoid adultery, sex outside of your marriage. Sex and marriage, they are big deals. And so God puts protections on it. God puts barriers around it. And he says, look, I made marriage. God I don't know if you've ever thought of this. God invented sex. Okay, can you imagine that? He's telling Adam and Eve, hey, go be fruitful and multiply. All right? But God's going to put these protective boundaries on it. And he is going to say, look, I've made this and I've made it good but if it's used incorrectly, if it's used outside the boundaries that I've put up, it will be destructive for you. A big thing in our culture now is cohabitation, living together before marriage. You're trying it out, you know, kind of like how you try on a pair of shoes. I always thought that that whole illustration was, was, was silly. Like people would say, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just buy a pair of shoes without trying them on. I'm like, are you saying that the lady you live with it's like a pair of sneakers. Okay, did, did, does she know that you compare her that way? Okay, is she cool with that? All right. But here's the thing. Couples that do that have a significantly higher divorce rate once they get married. Matter of fact, it is more likely that after they have a child that they will divorce than they will stay together. That God has protections on this thing called marriage and this thing called sex for a reason. There have also been numerous studies done that examine people's satisfaction with their sex life. And you would think it would be like the crazy, you know, people that have the most satisfying sex life. You know what they consistently find? Is that when people follow the Christian pattern of marriage and sex, they are usually very satisfied. Whereas people who are very loose generally are not satisfied at all. It's almost like God knew what he was doing when he laid these things down. That God has your own best interest at heart. Even when we don't. Even when we think we can do things differently and be happier, God says, look, I promise you, this is the way to go because it's better. God says that when we have sex, that we become one flesh, that, 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 that in marriage and, and what consummates marriage, which is sex, we become one flesh. And check this out. You can't un-one one, okay? It's like these two sheets of paper here, Okay? I've, I've got, these, got these papers here, and if I am going to make them one, I will, I will glue them together, and I will stick them 
And just like a show on the Food Network, I will instantly have them ready. All right? Check this out. When you become one, and then you try to become unone, it doesn't work well at all. There's always part of you. It's never the same. And a lot of you, you know this better than I do. And I'm sure this is not a good moment. I'm also sure that if you were up here, you'd probably agree with me. Yeah, I've lived it. Let me tell you, there is forgiveness in Christ. There is healing in Christ. There is a removal of shame and guilt in Christ. But let me tell you what's even better is not having to go through that. So if you can, try things God's way. I promise that it's better. If you're like these pieces of paper and you've tried to un-one what God has made one and you're dealing with a lot of that junk, let me tell you, there is healing. There is forgiveness. There is removal of shame and guilt. And you can move on. And God can bless your life. And God can give you happiness that, that you want. But there's always going to be that scar tissue there. Because you can't un-one when God has made one. One last thing when it comes to this this verse, one last thing that I think is very important that we know is that there are two types of women and there are two types of men, okay? So if you're a woman, there are two types of men. If you're a man, there are two types of women, okay? Very, very broad categories, okay? But I, I bet pretty quickly you can, you can figure out who's who, okay? Here's the two categories. My spouse and not my spouse, all right? Those are the two categories. Okay, if you're a man, that's the two categories of women, my wife and not my wife. And then if you're, if you're a woman, there's my husband and not my husband. All right, those, those are the two categories that God gives. And so let me tell you how you treat the, the people that fall into those two categories. If it is your spouse, if it is your husband, if it is your wife, and you love them and you cherish them and you respect them and you have lots of sex with them, okay, you do that and you make an amazing life with them. But the people in the other category, do you know what the, the Bible actually teaches that you do? You treat them like a brother or a sister. That's what you do. You're older than me and you're not my wife. You're like my big sister. You're younger than me, but not my wife. You're like my little sister. You know what I don't do to my little sister? Mmm, she looking good, okay? I don't do that to my little sister, okay? I don't look at pictures of my little sister naked on the internet. I don't read fantasy books about my little sister. I don't have a sister, okay? So it, it helps. But here's the thing. Our call is this, to give honor to marriage and to remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Sex and marriage, they are big deals. Sexual liberation is not a progressive thing. It is a regressive thing. If you think it's progressive to treat people like objects, for your gratification, you want to go back to that time with the Greeks and the Romans. But if you truly want to honor people, 
and give other people your very best and to treat them well. We do things the way that Christ has done things. That we're not settling for short-term pleasure and long-term heartache. We're setting ourselves up for long-term joy. And yeah, in the short term, we may have to get made fun of. But you know what? It's worth it. It is worth it. So even if you're not sure about this whole Christianity thing, you've got to admit, Jesus changed things. He changed things radically. What would a world without Jesus look like? I tell you, you don't want to live there. What if we actually lived this out? What if we took sex as seriously as God does? What if we made marriage as big of a deal as God has it? What if we handled our sexuality the way that God has called us to handle our sexuality? What if I truly looked after my wife's best interests and she truly looked after mine? What if I didn't view other people as objects, but I actually love them? What if my wife truly loved me and I truly loved her? What if I truly respected her and she truly respected me? How would the world be different if that's how we all lived. That's the world that Jesus came to build. That's the world with 